Hi everyone, I hope you're having a good week. I realised that whilst I haven't been on booktube for five years, I've been on here just over four years, I have made a best of books for the past five years. So for 2014, 15, 16, 17 and 18. And I'll link all those videos in the description box down below. Now what I thought I'd do today is get my computer, which is here. I don't know why I felt the need to pick it up in case you thought I was lying and didn't have my computer there. Is I have all of those videos here and I thought I would go through them, remind myself of which book books were my favourite from each year and tell you a little bit about those books, just how how they have lasted I suppose, whether I still consider them favourites or whether they were more of the moment and then I am going to write down books as I go that I consider to be my favourite books of the last five years and at the end of the video I'm going to try and order those, I'm going to pull them from my shelves, I'm going to try and put them in some sort of order and we can have a top 10, probably more than a top 10 books of the last five years. Cool? Let's do it. Okay let's start with 2014. What's going to be interesting actually is looking at reading years as a whole and seeing if any were more successful than others. I haven't studied these prior to filming this video because I wanted to just talk about it as I went. So I've opened the description box and in at number 10 for 2014 was Bird Box by Josh Mailerman, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, especially with the new Netflix film. That book terrified me, um, but I think it's definitely of the moment. It's not one that I cling to as a favourite now. Then that number nine was The Girl Who Couldn't Read by John Harding. This was a gothic book. Um, I remember finding the ending a little bit confusing and a bit of a letdown, though it was very, very atmospheric. Number eight, Elizabeth is Missing by Emma Healy. Um, this again was a really fun book. I much preferred it to Emma's second book, which came out in 2018 and which I didn't really like, but it was good again for the time. It hasn't, it's not one of my favorites, not gonna put it on the list of all time favorites. We Were Liars by E. Lockhart. I'm actually surprised looking at this that it's as high on the list as it is, but clearly, at that time, it was one of my favourites. Um, I don't really have too many memories of that one at all that I can share. Uh, number six, A Song for Issy Bradley by Karis Bray. I have very fond memories of this one because it was the first novel that Karis wrote. I'd previously read her short story collection, Sweet Home, which is one of my all time favourites. I preferred her novel, Museum of You, but obviously this was still on my favourites of the year, so I love that one too. But I don't think it's a favourite of all time. Then we've got All the Birds Singing by Evie Wilde, which is beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh... No, I don't think it's gonna make it onto the list either though. The Girl With All The Gifts by M. R. Carey. Again, I'm surprised that was so high up, but it was, I was gonna call it a romp. It's not a romp, unless it's a zombie romp. Is that a, is that a thing? A zombie romp? Um, one like Bird Box that I associate with fun times, being scared, it's fast paced, and um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, number three, Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World by Haruki Murakami. This one is complicated for me because I remember absolutely loving this book, but I feel like, and I've spoken about this in other videos, Murakami used to be one of my favorite authors, but I, I feel like I overindulge on Murakami. It can feel a little, a little bit samey, lots of spaghetti, jazz, girls with no personalities, poor queer representation, um, and talking cats. So this one is different to many of his other books. I think this is one of his earlier books. It's weirder. Um, and parts of it reminded me of Philip Pullman a little bit. But because my overall feeling about Murakami has changed, I hesitate to include this on my favorite books of all time simply because I feel like it's tainted. I'm not saying the book itself is in any way bad, but I find it difficult to love it as much as I did. That's just how I feel. And then we've got Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Zeki in at number two, um, which is, it is fantastic. It is wonderful, but I forgave it at the time. I, I, I spoke about this, I, I remember in a review saying that the ending, I didn't like the direction that the ending took. I find it unbelievable and, um, it sucked me out of the book and I forgave it because I loved the beginning of it. But looking back, I don't think I can include it on an all time favorites list because of that, what I consider to be a flaw. Um, but book number one is The Book of Strange New Things by Michelle Faber, which is gonna go on my favorite books of all time because I mean, if you've been around here longer than a week, you've probably heard me mention it. 
I'll speak in more detail about the books I'm adding to this all times favourite list at the end of the video. Okay, so only one from 2014. Let's move on to 2015, where I picked 15 books for my top favourite books of 2015. I see what I did there. And then in at number 15, I put Some by David Eagleman. This is a short story collection, and I have very fond memories of it. And I'm actually surprised looking at this list that it is the last favourite on this list. And I've put in brackets Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman next to it, because clearly I didn't want to have 16 because I wanted to have 15 because I thought that was a good number. But I remember linking those two and I still do link those two very firmly in my head. Isn't it funny how you can do that with books that you read side by side? So I would say both of these are short story collections, even though the publishers claim that Einstein's Dreams is a novel. They're both fragmented anyway. So some is a little bit like Black Mirror. It's called 40 Tales of the Afterlife. So 40 different versions of what heaven or hell or purgatory might be like. And then Einstein's Dreams is Einstein dreaming about different worlds where time and space interact or present themselves in different ways. Um, I don't think they're all-time favourites, but I highly recommend both of them. Then we've got The Crimson Petal and The White um, by Michelle Faber, which I adore. Um, it may be silly, but I think I want to include one book per author in this list, unless I feel very, very strongly otherwise. So I'm not going to include this one here, but again, one I would highly recommend. Next we have The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making by Catherine M. Valenti. Um... I'm not sure about that one. I'm gonna come back to it. Then we've got A Portable Shelter by Kirsty Logan. I really did love that short story collection. Um, I don't think it's gonna make the favorites list, but after that we have Grief is a Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. This is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 on my list. And I'm really surprised by that because I am gonna include that in my favorites book. So I'll talk more about that later on in the video, but I'm just gonna make a note for myself. Um, then we've got Beyond the Pale by Emily Urquhart, which is a non-fiction book where Emily talks about albinism around the world and how folklore and albinism interact with each other. It's really, really interesting. I don't think it's gonna make my all-time favorites. Then we've got The Stone Gods by Jeanette Winterson, which is a fabulous sci-fi dystopian about how, a, a little bit like what I wanted Cloud Atlas to be and wasn't for me, which is how the same kind of people exist in different time periods. I think if you liked the show Maniac, you would really enjoy this as well. I don't think it's gonna make my favorites list because it's not my favorite by Jeanette Winterson. Um, not necessarily out of the five years, I just mean out of any of her books that I've read, it's, it's not my absolute favorite, I don't think. Oranges are not the only fruit is, because I'm predictable. Um, then we've got our Endless Number Days by Claire Fuller, which was really enjoyable, but is not gonna make my all-time favorites list. The House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods by Matt Bell. So much fun, so dark and twisted, and I think the writer in me loved it for the experiments that it did, but looking back on it, it, it was quite flawed and I excused a lot of things. I think because I read it right at the end of the year and that's the trouble with doing favorites videos because the closer you are to something, the more difficult it is to see it objectively. Then we've got The Giant Beard That Was Evil, which is a wonderful graphic novel, but not one that I'm gonna include in my favorites. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer, again, one I would recommend wholeheartedly but I'm not gonna put it in my favorites. Okay, so then we get to the tricky ones. So we've got Peter and Alice by John Logan, A Guide to Being Born by Ramona Ossibel, The Dumb House by John Burnside, and The Exhibit by Lauren Eggert Crow. <laughs> of course, like with the book of the Strange New Things, if you've been here for five minutes, you know I love The Dumb House. So that is definitely going on my all time favorites list. A Guide to Being Born is one of my favorite short story collections because it has some of my favorite short stories in it, but the collection as a whole, um, I remember that there were stories I didn't love quite as much. So I think I'm gonna leave that one, even though it is one of my all time favorite short stories, I'm gonna leave that one. Peter and Alice by John Logan, I bawled my eyes out when I read this play. It is about um, Peter Llewellyn Davies and Alice Liddell, the real life versions of Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland and their imagined meeting. I think I am gonna include this one because well, I've just told you what it was about. And I was gonna speak about it at the end. That's fine. You can hear about it twice. Peter and Alice, I think I am because it really did destroy me when I read it. Um, and then we've got The Exhibit by Lauren Eggert Crow. This was my favorite book of the year. I read it late in the year, um, but because it's so short, it is a chat book. It hasn't had that lasting, it hasn't lasted with me. Um, so, 
think I may leave it from my all-time favourites but um, I'll link it down below. Well, no, I will link the video where I talk about it and then that's linked in the description. It's like a, it's like a box that has lots of little boxes inside it. I'm gonna leave it from my list today. Okay, then we get on to my favorite books of 2016. So, so far we've got one, two, three. Oh no, I said I, would gonna, I was gonna come back to The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland. I still don't know. I'm gonna come back to it at the end. Please remind me. Okay, so 2016, how many did I pick that year? I picked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. If I remember correctly, 2016 was a very good reading year for me. Um, all right, so we've got Museum of You by Karis Bray. This was the, this is um, number, I can't remember how many, how many I just counted, but it was the last of my favorites, the bottom of my favorites, but still a favorite. Museum of You by Karis, Karis Bray is a wonderful exploration of family and it has a beautiful child narrator in it. So if that is your jam, do check that out. Then we've got The Butcher's Hook by Janet Ellis. I recorded a podcast with Janet, which I'll also link down below. The book is so creepy and delightful and took unexpected twists and turns. Uh, Ruby by Cynthia Bond, um, I felt uh, scarred by. <laughs> um, it is a traumatic read. It is wonderful though. I'll link my review of it in the description box down below. I don't think any of these are gonna make my favorites, but then we have uh, The Morning They Came For Us, Spatches from Syria, a hard hitting book about Syria. Um, Measures of Expatriation by Varni Kapaldea was a wonderful poetry collection looking at language and how you can find home in language. The Vegetarian by Han Kang, which is my favorite by her, but I don't think I'm gonna include it in my favorites of the last five years. Um, then Under the Skin by Michelle Faber. Again, oh, I am more tempted by this though. I'm gonna come back to Under the Skin. I know I said I wasn't gonna include one book. Um, no, more than one book by the same author unless I felt really compelled to. And I feel like I may feel compelled to with Under the Skin. It really has been a grower for me. The, the longer it goes on, the more I think about it. It's very strange. Uh, after that, we've got Another Day in the Death of America by Gary Young. And I am going to include this on my favorites list. Um, so I'll talk about that at the end. Okay, after that, we've got Blue Beyond Blue by Lauren Slater, which is a fantastic short story collection. It has um, fairy tales in it. I don't think I'm gonna include it in my all-time favorites, but again, obviously, I recommend. Why God is a Woman by Nin Andrews, which I am gonna include in my all-time favorites. Autumn by Ali Smith, which I am gonna include in my all-time favorites. And The Tidal Zone by Sarah Moss, which I am going to include in my all-time favorites. So 2016 really was a very good reading year. I'm making a note of Under the Skin and I'm gonna decide later because I'm not sure. So now we're on to 2017. Um, I didn't pick many books in 2017. I picked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, okay. So I had The Invention of Angela Carter, which is a fantastic biography of um, Angela Carter, uh, and it was one of our winners for the Somerset Mom Award that year, and it really was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm not gonna include it, though, in my all-time favorites. I'm being very, very, very picky here. Uh, Creating Freedom, Creating Freedom? Creating Freedom by Raul Martinez was a wonderful political book, but I'm not gonna include it in my all-time favorites. Stranger Baby by Emily Berry is a wonderful poetry collection about grief. Margaret the First by Daniel Dutton is uh, a literary feast. Um, it's, it really is delightful to read about Margaret Cavendish, but I'm not gonna include it in my all-time favorites. Don't Call Us Dead by Dinez Smith. I am going to include in my all-time favorites. Uh, then we've got Winter by Ali Smith. Um, I think what I might do because autumn and winter are part of a series really is I might just present them both on my all-time favorites list um, but I think um, I'm not actually sure which of the two I did prefer so we'll leave it there and then also The Heart by Melida Karangel was my favorite book of 2017. It's a French novel that's been translated into English by Sam Taylor. It's known as Men the Living in the UK. I have a US edition called The Heart. It's about a boy who dies and then his family are told that he was a organ donor. So it's about whether or not they're gonna let the doctor take his heart and give it to another woman. And we follow the family and the woman who's going to receive the heart. It is beautiful, um, 
but it has faded over time for me. So I think I'm actually not going to include it in my favorite books of the last five years. And then we get on to 2018, which of course I just did. And as I mentioned in this video, it is difficult to get distance from things that you have read very recently. But the two I would like to include from 2018 are my top two books of 2018, which are A Place For Us by Fatima Farhi and Mirza and English Animals by Laura Kay. So I'm gonna scribble those down. Okay, so going back to the ones that I was gonna go back to, I'm not gonna include Under the Skin by Michelle Faber in my all 10 favorite books because I did prefer The Book of Strange New Things. I'm gonna be strict with myself. And I don't think I'm gonna include The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland because I loved the first book, I did, but the series, it did deteriorate over time and I actually never finished the fourth book. So I still love it. I still think it's great to go back to for comfort reading, but I do agree that the plot somewhat meanders and it isn't, it, it could be tighter, it could be more compact, but I love it for everything that it is. Um, so I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna leave it on the shelf for now. Okay, so that leaves us with 11 books. So I'm gonna pull them from my shelves, put them in some order and come back to you. Okay, so I've pulled them off my shelves and I've put them into some sort of order. The top end of this list was really hard to do, but I've done it. Okay, so in at number 11, we have that play I mentioned called Peter and Alice by John Logan. It's an imagined meeting between Peter Llewellyn Davies and Alice Little, who did actually meet, but that meeting, what they said to each other was never recorded. So it's an imagined conversation where they're talking about what it's like to have their childhood written about and read by so many people. And it's it's really, as I said, heartbreaking. Next, we have the only nonfiction book on this list, which is Another Day in the Death of America by Gary Young. Gary is a British journalist who lives in the States and he decided to write about gun violence. Um, so he picked a random day in modern US history. I can't remember if he rolled a dice, I don't remember what he did, but he picked a random day and decided to write about all the children who had died that day due to gun violence. It was a day in 2013, 10 children had died. Some of that was due to arguments, some of it was down to family feuds that got way out of hand, some of it was down to accidents, some of it was down to lack of safety. It is a very traumatizing read, but um, uh, a very important, <laughs> important book. I know that you, that word is used a lot, but it is a very, very important book. And I've pressed it into the hands of many people over the years. Then we have a poetry collection. It's a prose poetry collection called Why God is a Woman by Nin Andrews. It's a social satire and all of the poems link together. I think if you're new to poetry, this is a really good one to go for. It's about an island where men sprout, bir sprout birds, where men sprout wings when they become teenagers, and then they become sexually objectified. So um, it's a switch of gender, but it's not binary either. It's absolutely fantastic. Then we've got The Tidal Zone by Sarah Moss. This is my first Sarah Moss and I've since read most of her backlist. I've also recorded a podcast with her which I'll link down below. This is about a young girl called Miriam who collapses at school. She stops breathing, she's rushed to hospital, they do revive her but then her and her family are worried that it's going to happen again and that they don't know because they don't know why it happens that they can't prevent it. We have a second poetry collection. This is Don't Call Us Dead by Denez Smith. This was our winner of best collection when I judged the forward prize last year. I have recorded a podcast with Denez, which I'll link down below. But this is about what it's like being queer, black and HIV positive growing up in America today. Next we have Grief is the Thing with Feathers. This is part novel, part poetry, um, part literary criticism. Um, it is about a family whose mother passes away, or wife in the case of the father. She leaves behind her husband and two young sons, and then this crow turns up at their door, who is Ted Hughes's crow from his collection, Crow, and he's an embodiment of grief, and he yells at them, he's horrible to them, he's really unfair because grief is unfair. It is written like poetry, it is like nothing really that I have ever read before. Again, I've recorded a podcast with Max, which I'll link down below. Then we have two that I'm counting as one. Um, we have Autumn by Ali Smith and Winter by Ali Smith. These are the first two in her seasonal quartet. She's currently writing about um, the political situation in the world, but specifically the UK. And it's just a coincidence that when she started writing, it was the lead up 
to Brexit. It had just been announced that there was going to be a referendum. She hadn't planned it that way. So these are really immediate books where the characters and the plot of those characters kind of serve as a political commentary but I don't mind that at all I find it absolutely fascinating there's so much to discuss in these books and I've made a video for each of these books talking about them in lots of detail which I'll link in the description box down below then this is where we get to the tricky bit because we have the top four and I find it very difficult to pick between these top four um, also, two of the books are books that I read last year, and as I mentioned, you tend to love things more that you have read and loved recently, but I don't think that's why they're so high up on this list. I've tried to be objective about it, as objective as I can be, and I truly think they belong in the top four. I've put these four in some vague order, but these are my top four full stop, and probably another day of the week I'd put them in a different order. So, in at number four, Four. We have English Animals by Laura Kay. This is about a Slovakian woman called Mirka who moves to the UK, goes to work in an English manor owned by a married couple called Sophie and Richard who manipulate her and she in turn learns to manipulate them. It is just absolutely delightful and so vivid. Then we have The Dumb House by John Burnside which is also vivid and if you don't like reading about dead things, don't read this. I don't know what it says about me that this also includes taxidermy, which it, it, reading it did make me squeamish, but it, it's it, it's so fit in with the plot. And this has a lot of death in it, uh, a lot of violence. Um, so this is not for the faint hearted at all. This is about a man called Luke who believes that maybe if he kills things and witnesses death, he will be able to see someone's soul exiting their body. So as you might imagine, not very nice things happen to the people who surround him. If that sounds like your cup of tea, then you're dark like me. Then we have this, which is A Place For Us by Fatima Fahi and Mirza. I recorded a podcast with Fatima, which I'll link down below. I'll also link a long written review that I did of this book. This is about an Indian American Muslim family, five members of that family, looking about 20 years uh, of their lives, their relationships with each other, and why one member of the family is estranged from the rest. It is about all of the little moments that come together to make up one catastrophic thing, or something that isn't that catastrophic, but that just becomes something huge that you can no longer fix. And then in at number one, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, as I said, these last four are in a, va a very vague order, we have The Book of Strange New Things by Michelle Faber. Now, one of the reasons I've put this as number one is because Michelle has become one of my favourite authors. I have read uh, all of his books? All of his books. I've read all of his books. I have recorded a, not a podcast because I didn't have the podcast at the time, but I recorded a video with him where I spoke about his books. So I'll link that in the description box down below. That was back in 2015. Um, so we both look quite youthful. Um, and this was the book that first introduced me to his work. There were others like The Crimson Petal and The White and Under the Skin that could easily have made this list. So for that reason, I'm putting this one at number one, even though I was pretty sure it should be at number one. That is also why it's there, apart from my love just for this one thing. It is a representation of my love for all of his books. So this is about a man called Peter who was sent to the other side of the universe to preach the word of God to an alien life form. And um, I can't remember how much is revealed at the beginning, so I don't want to say why he is sent, but it is a dystopian book. It is about what makes us human. It is about how damaging we humans can be, both to ourselves and to um, other species. And I was completely lost in it. I picked it up the day that it came out and I did not put it down. So there we go. So those are all the books that I think are my favorites since joining booktube over the past five years, 11 books. I have read lots of other amazing books in that time, of course. So as I said, if you'd like to see my full list of favorites from each year, I'll link those videos in the description box. What are your favorite books from the last five years? 
What do you think? What's top of your list? Also, I want to know if you had guessed what was going to be on that list, because I think if you've been here a while, this list probably wasn't that surprising to you, but it was fun to go through everything and just to remember the books that I had loved and potentially reread some of these in the future. That's definitely something that I would like to do. I'm going to leave it there. I hope that you guys have a great week. Please subscribe if you're new and I'll speak to you very soon. Lots of books, love. Bye.